If sex is never a part of your earthly life, that's okay because you realize that every time you pray, you pray to the most joy-filled, happy, fulfilled man ever to walk the face of the earth and he never had sex. And that means that your life can have satisfaction and meaning and fulfillment because that's only temporary and it's only partial, but what is eternal and what is blessed is the forever family. Hey, do you remember having the talk with your mom and dad about the birds and the bees? Most certainly your head was bowed low, you hoped nobody was listening, no chance of eye contact. They use words and describe things that you would rather die than experience, am I right? I recently had to have the talk with my 11 year old son and after getting done and I thought quite eloquently laying out all the specifics about the birds and the bees, I said, now it's important that you not talk about this right now with, with your friends. And he looked back at me and he said, dad, How would this ever even come up? And I said, I get it, okay? Believe me, it will one day. But but for right now, I'm glad you feel that way. I know some of you are shuddering as I remind you of that awkward moment in your life, right? Well, today on Summit Life, I'm gonna share a little bit of the talk from a biblical perspective as it relates to, to our sexuality. Just like last week, I'd like to begin by advising you that today's program perhaps is not, not suitable for young children. So if you need to change the channel, I totally understand. But you can listen to the full message for free, free of charge anytime at jdgreer.com. Today, we're gonna talk about how to dispel the myths about sex with biblical truth. Also that we can see it as a, as a beautiful echo, echo of what God has planned for us as part of his eternal family. So grab your Bible and let's open it to 1 Corinthians chapter six and let's jump in. Porn rewires your brain to think of sex as just the selfish satisfaction of an urge. And when you train your mind that way, later when you get married, your ability to gauge in sex like God designed it as a fusion of souls where two people offer themselves to each other in self-giving love, that capacity is significantly diminished. And by the way, if you are married and you're nurturing on the side, it is killing your capacity to have fulfilling sex between you and your partner in your marriage. And that's the other way pornography destroys your soul, is it destroys your capacity, your capacity for sexual fulfillment. Andy Stanley says that every time you look at pornography, you rewire your soul to believe three things. Number one, you're telling your soul a real body is not good enough. Number two, only one body is, uh, only one body is not good enough. And number three, your wife's body is not good enough. Because no woman, no matter how beautiful she is, can live up to what you see in porn. Naomi Wolf, who is a pretty radical feminist, she was advisor to both President Clinton and presidential candidate Gore. She said, she said, for most men, real naked women are just bad porn anymore. No man, she says, has ever gorged himself on porn and then put it behind him after marriage because his wife met all his porn fantasies. Instead, the opposite happens. It retrains your appetite so that you can't be happy with sex in marriage. Pornography before marriage destroys sex in marriage. Trying to tell you porn is not a pastime, it is a pathway. It is a pathway to change fundamentally who you are. And it's not over here in one little corner of your life, it rewires you. It leads to higher rates of depression, lower rates of sexual satisfaction. It has destroyed no telling how many marriages. Do not think that you can keep it over in one little corner and just put it away when you get married. That's not how your brain, that's not how Paul would say your soul works. I got a fire in my house, but it's no big deal because it's only in the closet and it's only in the guest room. Hey, it's coming for the whole building. Men, if you have pornography, I'm telling you for the sake of your relationship with all future women, you need to get rid of it today. And if you are not willing to address this in your life, then I challenge you. I challenge you to at least have the decency to tell your girlfriend or your fiance that this is not something you're able to deal with or wanna deal with so that she knows what you're bringing into their relationship because she has a right to know. That way she can go ahead and get out now if she wants to rather than have you destroy her heart later. You should at least have the decency to tell her. This is nothing to play around with. One psychiatrist said porn is more enslaving to people than heroin, statistically speaking. 
And what's scary is that the porn industry markets itself to 12 to 13 year olds. And they know that it only takes three days to become an addict. So can I just say, by the way, right here, parents, if you let your kids have phones in their rooms by themselves at night in a home without a filter on the internet, I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to tell you you don't know how to parent your kid and I know so much better, but I just have to think you're being incredibly naive incredibly naive as to what is actually happening. You might as well give them a loaded gun that they can cock and sleep and they're, they're put under their pillow at night. Again, I'm not trying to judge you or tell you you don't know what you're doing. I'm just trying to tell you to wake up to what's happening and wake up to what's going on out there and to the power of these things and the way that they are being marketed to your 12 and 13 year old. I'll tell you, my family uses a service called Covenant Eyes. It's something we have on our, all of our devices and our computers. We actually use it here at the church and a lot of our pastors and staff team here use it because it's something that just, it's not because we don't trust each other. It's just because we understand how pernicious and how dangerous this stuff actually is. And we don't want a casualty of a marriage or a casualty of a life because of this. Now, again, I directed a lot of this issue toward men, but in our society, it's become just as much one for women in every way. And let me just go ahead and say it, okay? Romance novels function like pornography for women. These romance novels are soft porn for women made mainstream. They are not romantic. They are not harmless fantasy. They're destroying you. The Fifty Shades of Grey erotica series, which is the best-selling fiction book of the last decade, sold more than 100 million copies worldwide. There's nothing but pornography that Paul would say is sinning against soul and destroying you and destroying your marriage and your future marriage. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Now, I realize that at this point, some of you, you're probably feeling pretty overwhelmed because you're sitting here and you're like, this has been my life. And I've made a lot of these mistakes. You see, I'm in a little bit of a tough spot here, I'll be honest. Because there's a part of me that wants to tell you the dangers of sin. And I'm going to do that. I've tried to do that as clearly as I can. I'll tell you the reason God has these restrictions is because, not because he wants to keep you from something, because he has something for you. But at the same time, the main message of this church is not that this is the way you're supposed to live and this is the life you're supposed to live. And if not, well, you totally mess yourself up. The main message of this church is that we have a savior who came to live the life we were supposed to live and didn't. And then he died the death that we were condemned to die in our place. See, Jesus was called the man of sorrow. Some of you, your sexual mistakes have brought all kinds of sorrow into your life. Man of sorrows means that Jesus took those sorrows into himself so that he could make you new in him. So he could say, though your sins are like scarlet, I can make them as white as snow. And after he died on the cross, he rose from the dead. And what that resurrection was showing you is that there is no deadness that sin has put into your life that he cannot resurrect There is nothing that sin has broken that he cannot repair. There is nothing that sin has stolen that he cannot restore. And so he says, come to me because I can make all things new. One of my favorite verses related to this is what the prophet Joel says in the book of Joel. He says, I can restore, God says, I can restore what the locusts have eaten. The locusts were a sign of God's judgment. They were a sign of God's judgment that came in because of Israel's sin. And God said that when Israel repented, not only did he tell the locusts to stop, He actually said, I can restore all that stuff that they ate. What kind of God of grace are we talking about? What kind of God of grace says, not only will I stop the curse, I actually go back to all the places your sin brought the curse and I'll repair it. That means that those of you that sexual sin has destroyed your soul. It has destroyed your marriage. Well, see, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. Man of sorrows, what a name. For the Son of God who came, why ruin sinners to reclaim? Hallelujah, what a Savior. And I feel like sometimes up here trying to show you the the real dangers of sin, I don't want you to lose the fact that what this message is about is this is about a Savior. I don't stand up here and preach the law as important as the law is. I want to tell you about redemption. I want to tell you about hope. I want to tell you about a Savior who took sin into his own body and overcame it so that he could restore you. Uh, my friend, Matt Chandler, um, he and I are about the same age. He's a, a pastor out in Dallas. Um, he says that when, um, when he and I were both, you know, I didn't know him when we were young, but um, back then the, 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 the thing was the True Love Weights rally. Anybody remember that, True Love Weights rally? Every youth group, every year went to True Love Weights. And it was, it was a good thing, but it was like, you know, it was kind of like getting uh, teenagers to commit, take a vow to remain, you know, pure until they got married. 
And the motives were, you know, I'd say vastly good, but a lot of times in the effort to kind of teach this, the actual Christian message itself got either diluted or lost. Matt tells the story one time of being in an audience, probably about the size of the one in front of me right now, you know, a thousand or so people. And, and uh, Matt um, said that, he says, I was sitting there and the guy, when he got up to give the talk, he took out a rose, beautiful rose. He said, any girl in here would love this rose, right? Yeah. He said, all right. He, he, he hands it to a person on the one side of the auditorium and says, I want, while I talk up here, I want everybody to smell this rose. I want you to touch the petals and feel how soft it is and make sure everybody in here in the whole audience gets a touch. So about 30 minutes, the guy gives his talk. When those 30 minutes are done, he says, okay, where's that rose? And he gets it from the last person and now it's all wilted and petals have fallen off and it's drooping and it just looks terrible. And he holds this up and he says, who wants this rose? Nobody wants this rose. And he throws it kind of in a sort of a dramatic illustration. He said, and that's what some of you are doing to yourselves by giving yourself sexually away before you got married. And Matt said, I just sat there and I felt like, he said, I was a brand new Christian and I want to stand up and I wanted to say, Jesus wants the rose. Jesus came for the rose. He came to die for the rose so that he could restore the rose. So yes, sin causes damage. Sin leaves consequences, but you have a savior that died for those things and overcame those to the grave so that he could restore you. He breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free. So please understand that when I am up here, I'm not just saying, yes, I'm trying to tell you about these dangers of sin, but I also want you to understand that you have a savior that came for ruined sinners. I'll give you one more illustration on this. In Matthew, the gospel of Matthew's genealogy of Jesus. If you go through there, you'll notice that there's a couple of names he puts in there. And if you're reading them, you're like, these don't really belong, it doesn't seem. Because in Jesus's bloodline, God arranged it so that there was a former prostitute. Listen to this. And that Jesus himself came through the offspring of David and Bathsheba's adultery. What is that trying to tell you other than the fact that God can bring Christ out of even the worst kinds of sexual sin? And friend, if God can bring Jesus into the world through a former prostitute and an adulterous relationship, he can bring Christ into your life and he can bring beauty out of your ashes. That's what the whole thing is about. That's what the whole thing is about God's power to restore. So again, in standing up here, I've got a dual purpose. I wanna show you what's at stake in sexual sin, but I also wanna proclaim that Jesus heals and restores sinners. But I need you to put away the myth that sex is just casual. The limitations that God puts on sex he does so for your good. Many young singles don't want to wait to have sex because they're afraid they're going to miss out on something. Oh, my friends are talking about it. Oh, man, I just want to be able to have a story to share back with them. And I feel like I've just been deprived. All these rules are keeping me from things. Friend, God tells us to wait to have sex precisely so we won't miss out on something. One of the most important questions in life is this. What exactly is the gospel? Is it a set of rules to follow? A lifestyle to uphold? This is something we have to get right. Scripture tells us that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's not about religion, it's about relationship. Religion keeps telling us that we need extra layers, but, but that's just not true. Religion says be and, and do it a certain way to be accepted, but, but that's not true either. The truth is that you are loved so deeply and accepted so fully in Christ that all you should be experiencing in Him is freedom. Freedom from yourself, freedom from your sin, and freedom from the pressure to do or to act a certain way to, to earn anything. This is the good news of the gospel, a relationship with God. And this, this truth is what we hope that you will embrace and enjoy for the rest of your life and your eternity. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in scripture, We'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The Gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 
866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. Yeah, you can get forgiveness for sexual sin, but forgiveness is painful and the consequences can leave deep scars. Plus, I'll just tell you, if you're sitting here right now thinking, well, I don't know, I'll just have a little fun right now and I'm a serious teenager, college student, and then I'll get forgiveness later. If that's your attitude, I got to question whether you actually belong to Jesus. How could you love Jesus and still openly pursue the things that you know put him on the cross? How could you know that Jesus is a part of your life and subject him to that kind of willful sin in your life? 1 Corinthians 6, here's what Paul says. He says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? God put that spirit in you. You're not your own. Now you were on your way to, to destruction and, and Jesus bought you with a price. So obviously, somebody who understands that would want to glorify God with their body, right? How could you know that God, after purchasing you with his blood, puts his spirit in you? And now that his spirit is in you, it means that everything that you do now, he's got to be present for. And how could you say that you love him and then resubject him to the things that put him on the cross? If you know and love Jesus, you won't do that. Why would a person overwhelmed by God's goodness want to spit on it? Again, if that's your attitude, it makes you wonder, makes you wonder if you actually know him. First Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know? The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus had to die. Don't be deceived. You sit here like, well, we're living together. It's not that big of a deal. It's a big deal. Well, it's just a little harmless fun. Nope, it's a big deal. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Don't be deceived. The sexually immoral, those who openly practice it, will not. Because you can't say I love and serve Jesus and then just pursue what put him on the cross and act like it's not anything nor idolaters, nor adulterers. These will not inherit the kingdom of God unless they repent. Marriage is honorable to all. The bed is undefiled. It's beautiful. It's blessed. But the sexually immoral and adulterous, God will judge. Friend, God is very serious about sexual sin. Do not play games. But he does so because of his love. He does so because he recognizes it has such great power for good and therefore it has great power for harm as well. That's why in 1 Corinthians 6, he tells you to flee sexual immorality. You understand that a lot, usually when the Bible talks about temptation, it talks about enduring or withstanding or a way of escape God will make. But he says when it comes to sexual immorality, run from it. It's that destructive. 1 Peter 2, Apostle Peter agrees, abstain from these fleshly lusts because they actually go to war against your soul. They go to war against your soul and they destroy your capacity for loving relationships and they destroy your capacity to know and love God. Our culture says it's no big deal. And the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says it's a huge deal. Listen, friend, maybe you're sitting here and you're like, I still don't quite, I, still, I just don't get it. I just don't, still don't see how it's that big of a deal. Here's my question. If that's you, do you trust God enough to do it his way? Do you actually believe God? You see, this is an area where God tests you to see if you're actually willing to wait on him. This is one of those areas, especially when you're single, that God's like, I just want to see, are you going to do this my way? Or are you going to do it your way? I sometimes talk to college students and the college students will be like, yeah, I just, I'll get saved later. I'll become a Christian later. Right now I'm enjoying my sexual freedom too much. And I'm like, do you realize what you're giving up? You're talking about a little sexual pleasure that's not going to be that fulfilling anyway is we see it from these different studies and it's actually gonna mess you up. And you're, what you're trading for that is a relationship with God. You're trading for it eternal life. If you wait, not only will you get God, I'm telling you, God gives his best to those who wait and trust him and do it his way. You'll find that is true in every area, especially this one. If you wait, you'll be glad. I feel like I have to quote here from our friend, Dr. Danny Aiken. He's the president of Southeastern Seminary over here in Wake Forest, not far from where I am right now. I wrote a book years ago called God on Sex. I'm gonna quote him because I could never get away with saying what he said here, so I'm just gonna quote it. It's not surprising that a University of Chicago study reports that those doing it God's way report the most satisfaction with their sex lives. When University of Chicago researchers set out to discover which religious denominations have the best sex, they learn that the faithful don't do all their shouting in church. 
Sorry, I told you I couldn't say it. <laughs> Conservative Protestant women reported by far the highest satisfaction in sex. Mainline Protestants and Catholics lagged five points behind. Those with no religious affiliation were more than 33 points behind, and Unitarians may not wish to read any further. Sexually active singles have the most sexual problems and get the least pleasure out of sex. Men with the most, quote, liberal attitudes about sex are 75% more likely to fail to satisfy their partners. The most sexually satisfied demographic group of them is that of Protestant married couples between the ages of 50 and 59. Cosmopolitan touts, Cosmo's 20 favorite sex tips ever. We have the wall shaking, earthquaking moves that will make your bed end up clear across the room. However, the statistics suggest that if you're really interested in the best sex possible, find you a born again babe and keep her around until she's 50 because that's when the best will come. <laughs> Told you I couldn't say it. I just, I just got Danny to say it. The point is do it God's way. Do it God's way again. God doesn't tell you to avoid sexual immorality because he wants to keep you from something. He tells you to avoid it because he wants to bless you with something. All the ways of God are good. As I close, I wanna hit one more myth really quickly. We've touched on it each week, but this myth is at the heart of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 19. And Jesus' answer to this myth is an important component of his teaching on marriage and sex. So really quickly, myth number three. Sex is the best part of life. Our culture says sex it is, is an essential part of life. You can't be happy without it. But see, that's why I showed you Jesus includes the part about the eunuchs in his teaching on marriage in Matthew 19. Eunuchs, again, represent single people. And Jesus said these eunuchs, single, are still full participants in the blessing of God, full participants in the family of God, and all the blessings of the kingdom are theirs even though they're not married. And what Jesus is saying is, Marriage and sex are not really what life's ultimate blessings are and they're not the essential parts of life because soon enough in eternity, none of us will be married. That which is partial and temporary, marriage and sex, will have given way to that which is permanent and eternal, Christ and the church. So that means if I've got a chapter in my life without sex, whether that's because I'm single or maybe it's because I'm not in a good marriage and sex is just really no longer part of my or marriage and, and, and my spouse just won't cooperate but for whatever reason, sex is not a part of my, my life. Yes, that is difficult and I don't wanna downplay that. If that's you and that's not a part of your life, I understand that that could be something you have to endure but what you need to hear is that you can still find real joy in life and real meaning and real satisfaction. If sex is never a part of your earthly life, that's okay because you realize that every time you pray, you pray to the most joy-filled, happy, fulfilled man ever to walk the face of the earth and he never had sex. And that means that your life can have satisfaction and meaning and fulfillment because that's only temporary and it's only partial, but what is eternal and what is blessed is the forever family. So eunuchs who represent single people, they can find full satisfaction in the family of God. You see, ironically, our culture both undervalues sex by not recognizing its power and it overvalues sex by thinking that it is essential for a happy life. But neither of those things are true. Neither of those things are true. And that's what the Bible's teaching on this liberates you to. My friend, Christopher Yuan, tells a story of growing up same-sex attracted. He said, when I was a teenager, I asked God, I begged God to give me different desires, to give me heterosexual desires because I knew his word taught me that homosexuality was wrong. He said, but God did not answer that prayer at least the way that I, I wanted him to because I never developed heterosexual desires. And so for a while, I pursued an openly gay lifestyle, thinking that that's where I would find satisfaction. He says, but through a series of bad decisions, not only did I not find satisfaction, I hit rock bottom and even ended up in prison. He says, it was there in that prison cell that I met God. And God in that prison cell didn't give me a change of sexual orientation. But what he met me with was the offer of a forever family with his son. This is how he puts it. My identity now is not gay, it's not ex-gay, or even heterosexual for that matter. My sole identity is as a child of the living God made in the image of Jesus Christ. In that prison cell, I realized that a decision had to be made. I could either abandon God and pursue sexual freedom as I had been, or I could surrender sexual freedom and live as a follower of Jesus Christ. My decision was obvious, I chose to be a child of God. 
I used to think he said that to please this Christian God, I had to make myself straight. I had to make myself feel heterosexual feelings. But then I realized even those with heterosexual urges still struggle with sin and they still need to be redeemed. So that couldn't be the ultimate goal. No, our goal as Christians, no matter what feelings we have, must be holiness. And holiness is only found in the righteousness of Christ. Our identity must be solely in his righteousness, not in how sexually pure we feel. As I began to embrace this life of surrender and obedience, God even called me into full-time ministry. And he did that while while I was in a prison of all places. In other words, here's a guy who to this day will tell you that sexually, his urges, his attractions are, are same-sex attractions. He says, because he realizes the Bible says that that is not in the will of God. He says, if I don't ever get heterosexual desires, he says, then I've had to surrender that and say that sexual, this is not going to be a part of my life. He says, but that doesn't mean that I have a second-class life. He says, because I'm a child of God, and that's actually what's really important. And God's got a plan for me. And I've got the ultimate thing, which is God's forever family, and that's Okay. Sex is not ultimate. It's just an echo. It's a pointer of what God has for you in his forever family. So if it's something that's not a part of your life, you can still have a happy, joy-filled, meaningful life because the forever family, your identity is a child of God and the family of God. That's where real life and satisfaction comes from. To help you grasp the love of Christ for you found in Scripture, we'd like to send you a copy of What is the Gospel? A 20-day interactive devotional by J.D. Greer. This resource aims at taking a dedicated one-month period where Christian living is simplified, hopefully removing a whole bunch of the add-ons that have made it labored and complicated. We pray that you'll land on your feet, secure that God loves you and accepts you where you are when you come to Him in faith. The gospel is more than just the diving board into Christianity. It's actually the whole pool. So enjoy the freedom found in a right relationship with God. Request a copy of this devotional when you donate to support this ministry at the suggested level of $25 or more. Give us a call at 866-335-5220. That's 866-335-5220. Or go to jdgreer.com and request this resource today. It's time to settle this question once and for all. What takes conflicts to a heated, relationship-killing level? Be honest. I know the other person's at fault. I get that. But what takes it in your heart to a rage, to a point that it begins to fracture the relationship, is that person is keeping you from what you want, from what you're entitled to, right? What you feel like you can't be happy without, and that controls your emotions. Thanks for joining us today on Summit Life. As always, you can visit us at jdgreer.com. You'll find resources, transcripts, and all of our teaching available free of charge. We'll see you next time for Summit Life with J.D. Greer. Today's program was produced and sponsored by J.D. Greer Ministries.